The Ermac Centre is proud to present the SFU Fellows of the Royal Society of Canada Seminar Series. This bi-weekly series hosts five presentations per semester. For the spring 2013 semester, the presenters belong to the Departments of Economics, Physics, Humanities, and the Faculty of Education. Today's speaker is Dr. Martin Zuckerman from the Department of Physics. Our today's speaker is uh, Professor Martin Zuckerman, and it really it is my pleasure to introduce Martin, who's been a long-term uh, project leader here at Ermac Center. Uh, he is from the Department of Physics. Martin did his undergraduate and graduate work at Oxford University, completing a BA in mathematics and DPhil in theoretical physics. After one year as a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Chicago, he taught for short periods at the University of Virginia and Imperial College before moving to McGill University in 1969, where he remained until he retired as William C. McDonald Emeritus Professor of Physics in 1999. In mid-20s, he joined the Physics Department at SFU, where he remains a very active member of the Soft and Biological Physics Group. Early in his career, Martin worked in solid state and uh, many uh, body physics, but spent the bulk of his career working in theoretical, bio biological, and soft condensed matter physics. He is the author of more than 200 papers, has an age index of 41, and besides being a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada, he is an international member of the Royal Danish Academy of Science and Letters. He was a founder and the first director of the Center for Physics of Materials at McGill University from 1989 to 1999. The title of his talk today is Novel Synthetic Nanomotors that Mimic Biological Motor Properties, a Wonderful Activity for Retired Researchers. So please welcome Professor Zuckerman. Um, thank you very, very much for coming. I'm very flattered. Also, I don't quite know what 41H means, but it sounds good. <laughs> um, that's the, you know the title, so I'll, I'll, I'll start straight away. Um, I'm going to start looking at macroscopic transport versus molecular transport in cells. I'm then going to continue with the properties of, of a particular cytoskeletal motor protein called kinesin. I then go on to look at synth our synthetic um, protein-based motors, our various designs, and um, the motivation, we'd like to employ a modular protein design route using operating principles of biological molecular motors to construct more controllable and useful synthetic nanomotors. And specifics, design and construction of synthetic protein motors that are capable of um, of directional motion along a track using only combined non-motor protein and DNA parts. I just wish to remind you that molecular motors are protein motors, and that's why we chose to use, use protein moieties to, to construct them. OK, to go on. Um, suppose you want macroscopic transport and you want to uh, um, transport some apples. Well, you could, could sit under a tree and use Newton's laws and, and, and wait for them to fall. But, but you're much better off um, putting them in a cart or putting them in a truck. Um, let's see. And uh, so, the, so you, but the transport of material as such requires a machine which functions using fuel in the macroscopic world. And um, for the horse, it's food, metabolic energy, i.e. chemical energy, eventually that becomes mechanical work. Same for the truck. Um, petrol, I'm sorry I used the English word, didn't want to use gas. Um, for an aged person, that might mean something else. Petrol, uh, internal combustion um, to mechanical work, and um, the laws of motion of the, um, uh, 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 of, of the cart and the truck. Uh, the motion of the cart and the truck is directional and can be fully determined by Newton's laws of motion, I hope, um, i.e. f equals ma, as you know. Now, I just want to remind you that here we have a cab which is pulling something, and that's, which is pulling a load, and that's exactly what we end up with for, for the cytoskeletal motors, or some of them. So, then we have the important thing is that small fluctuations in temperature obviously don't concern you um, in this case. Huge ones may. So, now suppose you're looking at the transport of small molecules in water in an aqueous medium, um, if they're small enough, then you're in the overdamped limit. 
So acceleration doesn't count. Newton's laws are, are negligible, even though they're there. And what you have is you have, if you apply a force, the force is, is, is against um, the hydrodynamics, a drag coefficient. So you end up eventually, if it's a constant force, with uh, the force o uh, over the drag coefficient, which is proportional to the viscosity, i.e. The, um, the friction in the medium. Uh, now, suppose you just put a molecule, a simple molecule, and you want it to, a small molecule, you want it to get somewhere in a cell. Well, one thing you might hope is that at least it would be able to do random motion, i.e. it would do a random walk, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, um, i.e. the walk of a drunken man, which is caused by the water molecules scattering um, uh, against your, your small molecule, which you assume rather bigger. This has no directionality. Basically, I'm sorry, well, go, go, go back on that one. Um, so basically, what you have is, in this case, you have, instead of a constant force, you have a, um, the, the scattering of the water molecules gives you a random force here. And uh, the, the random force and the motion are due to temperature fluctuations, and it's slow, i.e., the distance, there's no directionality, and the distance is, is of the order of, the t of time to the half, whereas it were the time taken to the half, Whereas, um, if it were directional, it would be proportional to the time taken. Well, n now, you have another problem. Not only do you have this situation, but you actually have your molecule in a crowded cell. So you have this very crowded cell with all these fibrils. And so you're even worse off. Though I did read uh, um, an article which said that it's, it may be evolution evolutionarily useful. And that is diffusion in a crowded environment, i.e. the cell interior very crowded, then you have subdiffusion, which is even lower. So, suppose you want to transport a set of molecules, such as, for example, a set of neuro, some neurotransmitters in, in a vesicle in your, um, in your crowded environment. You're not going to do anything if you, if you just leave it there and hope it'll diffuse. So, so, nature's answer for fast directed molecular transport inside a cell um, is, is that, you ha you, that you basically, uh, um, evolution has constructed rather beautifully molecular nanomotors moving on a track. So let's have a look. This is, this, this is thanks to Nancy. Um, we're going to look at a particular, um, a particular motor. This motor is called kinesin. It's, uh, there are 45 different types of kinesin um, or um, moving different things. And they usually, they, they walk on a, on, um, on a microtubule. They, the tendency is to go from one cell to the other, from one end, one part of the cell to the other, particularly the area where, 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 where the production area to the use area, if you like. And so you have them moving along a track. At, uh, and I'll, I'll mention the, uh, the speed later on. And um, so you can see here, you, you have, th this is a particular, in this case, well, this is a vesicle, actually. So you have a motor moving a vesicle from the negative to the positive end. Uh, and you have one type of motor called kinesin, which I'll concentrate on, that, that moves from the negative to the positive end of microtubules. And you have another motor which can move from the positive end to the negative end. And if you stick both of those, as I shall show, on a, um, on, on a vesicle, say, on a bag with stuff in it, um, then you can use one to move one way to deliver and the other to move the other way to, to go back to the nucleus. So you have these various roads here. You also have a, uh, um, you have, if you look at this, you have, t um, I'll look at the structure um, in a moment. What you, what you have are two, what are called motor heads. I'm sorry about the word leg here. And, um, uh, and you have a stalk here and, you, and you, you can carry a cargo. Cargo is usually huge. Here you have 50 nanometers, but the cargo is micrometers. So it's very much like the picture of the cab and the truck that I showed you. And even more, uh, uh, the sizes are even more extreme. So the cargo, well, if you, kinesin, particularly in neurons, it can, uh, well, in this case, um, uh, it, 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 it can uh, um, move, uh, actually organelles like mitochondria, or the important things are sacs of chemicals, i.e. lipid vesicles filled, for example, in neuronal cells with neurotransmitters, which are created in the, in, 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 in the soma or the, or the area of the nucleus. These are, my, uh, uh, are micrometers in dimension. So if you actually look at kinesin, what you have, um, kinesin walk, doesn't walk on its feet, it walks on its heads. 
And I always have problems writing papers. I wrote a paper saying, we have a motor that, that whose feet are, and they say, no, they're not feet, they're heads. So there are problems. Still, what you have is you have two heads. The, this is where the catalysis occurs, which I'll mention in a moment. That's where the, where the actual um, enzymatic reaction happens. And I'll mention in a moment what it is. I think you all know it. Then you have two what are called neck linkers. They're, they're, small, they're linkers here. Then you have the stalk, and you have the cargo on the end of the stalk. And if you want to look at, sorry, if you want to have a look at what it looks like, because this is a protein, you can see the, the, the two motor heads here um, with, 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 with the catalytic sites, where, where, with, with the actual binding sites where the fuel goes. And, and here, these, these small things here are the neck linkers, and that's the stalk. OK, next slide. OK, the motors are protein motors. They are what you, we call mechanoenzymes. That means they use a catalytic process to convert chemical energy into mechanical energy. And, the, and they use the hydrolysis of ATP as the energy source. They move directionally along an actin, or in my case, it's going to be a microtubule track in an aqueous environment, which is usually crowded, as I said. The interesting thing is they're strongly affected by thermal fluctuations, as opposed to the, uh, the macroscopic world, uh, which act like a tempest. They use these thermal fluctuations to produce directed diffusion, which is known as thermal ratchet motion. And um, what I want to do now is just show you, uh, um, sh show you um, uh, an enzymatic cycle. So what you have here is you have these two, two heads here, and, and I've only got the two neck linkers. This is a very simple, um, uh, a very simple scheme. So you start off with the with with the lagging the the uh, the assume the the leading head is fixed. You look at the lagging lagging head. It's already bound uh, ATP, and um, the lagging head hydrolyzes ATP to ADP plus PI. Um, the f the uh, Gibbs free energy that comes from that causes a change in conformation, and the only change in conformation I've shown here is that, um, well, actually, uh, um, yeah, that causes a change in conformation. In particular, this the the the, the leading neck linker um, is strained, and then as soon as the PR, the the phosphate you've got sorry you've got ADP goes to um, ADP plus phosphate that state um, then the next step is that the phosphate is released and in releasing the phosphate you also um, relieve the tension and the tension causes something called a power stroke in which uh, and it also um, uh, um, and you also at the same time get uh, um, unbinding by the lagging head so you have unbinding and a relief of tension and the relief of tension is supposed to T take the uh, um, uh, 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 take the lagging head over to the leading head side, and that's um, a bit like a swish, which is called a power stroke. And then, then the next thing is that um, once it gets to the leading side, it um, it binds. The ADP comes off and it stays there, and then the whole process starts again. Now, um, so I have the new leading head binds to track and releases ADP. I put this arrow here to say this is not the whole story. And in fact, the rest of the story is rather interesting. So this is the rest of the story. Basically, the rest of the story here is that here you have um, the process I mentioned. Then you have the power stroke. In the power stroke, you notice, first of all, the neck linker, uh, neck linker is extended. But at the same time, there's still energy left to change the conformation of, of the leading head. And, and what happens in the leading head is that a cleft opens, and, you f and part of this, uh, um, part of this uh, neck linker zippers onto the leading head, as you can see here, zippers onto the leading head, shortens it in such a way that the, uh, the diffusional search after the power stroke has been done is, is restricted. So you get a restricted diffusional search, which really puts the, uh, um, puts the head very close to the binding site, and then it binds. So you have zippering of neck linker onto motor head just before binding to microtubule. This turns out to be um, a three-step uh, three process, um, basically based on electrostatics. 
and it leads to restricted diffusional search. So the diffusional search is restricted and binding to track. OK, I just want to show that as a movie while I go on. Hopefully, yep, sorry. What do I do? So it's just going backwards now. Now you see the whole process, which I won't describe again. Um, now, the interesting thing about this motor is that it can take more than, that's kinesin, can take more than 100 steps of 8 nanometers each. There you can see the neck linker binding. You'll see it again next time. It can take 100 steps of 8 nanometers per second at speeds of 1 micrometer, um, one, uh, micrometer per second. Um, that's equivalent to a sprinter running 100 meters in less than a second. So it's really quite tough. Um, then each step uses one ATP molecule. That, um, that's the fuel in the cell. And as I said, that's coupled to, to directional motion, power stro stroke plus directed diffusion by a conformational changes. The efficiency, well, there's a big argument about efficiency. You know, some people say 50%, some people say 100%, but I don't want to get into it. Yes? Yes, they, they, well, it's, it's a hand, it's what's called a hand over hand mechanism. Okay. Because there was an argument. Some people thought it was an inchworm mechanism. And then um, Yildiz, I think Yildiz was a young Turkish guy um, working in a group, did very well, um, um, uh, made pointed, uh, uh, um, um, decreased the fluorescence, uh, the, you know, decreased the fl um, fl fluorescence beam, if you like, and he was able to see it was a hand over hand mechanism. So it really, it really sort of goes like this, you know. And will, will that transmit onto the stem? Um, I'll show you a picture of what happens with the stem next. Um, I think, I think the answer is yes, but the stem is very long. So, uh, um, I don't think so. Okay, let's see. So here we have a movie of what happens in the cell. And I should remind you that it's a very nice movie. It's the same thing. I think it's by the same group. And uh, um, what you see is you see it moving there. But uh, it's supposed to be moving in a crowded environment. But that crowded environment is not crowded enough. So it's probably much worse. OK, that's kinesin. And that's, uh, I'm just going to check the time. That's not too bad. Um, that's kinesin. And I just wanted to introduce uh, um, the uh, aspect of the motion of kinesin, which is very processive, uh, i.e. it sticks to the track for 100, 100 steps of 8 nanometers each. And I wanted to show you the detailed motion, which I will be using, I'll be trying to mimic. And that's the whole idea of showing you this. OK, now we want to build some molecular motors. This is the happy crew that, uh, of, of, of whom I've had the pleasure of working with. They're all their names. They're, they're the principal names here, including our own Nancy Ford, who's been a fantastic colleague. They're all fantastic colleagues, actually. And the research goals are, basically, it's my, my side is the simulation, determine design criteria for synthetic bio-based nanoscale machines, basically. And also apply these criteria to experimentally synthesize and characterize novel protein-based molecular motors. That's just to remind you. So that's what the next section is going to be about. Great. So. This is Nancy Ford's slide. She's been a real help. I'm such a bad typist that I'm surprised I got anything down at all. Um, so what are the requirements for a synthetic motor? A motor that you're actually, you're actually taking protein parts, putting them together. What do you need? One of the things is you need it to be unidirectional, that it walks preferentially on a track in the forward direction, whatever you choose the forward direction to be. Able to take many steps before detaching, that's processive, ideally walks quickly. but as Nancy points out, sticky feet, if, if, if it really sticks very well, so it's very pr processive, you have very good binding, that could actually make it slower. Then uh, the other thing that's very important is it's the same, I mean, suppose you have your truck that we started with, and you just um, try to pull it backwards. Well, if you weakly pull it backwards and you're a human being, or a goat or something, You'll be, pulled, uh, with a, with, with a, you'll be pulled along. So the, um, uh, the, basically, the, the truck can still drive forwards even if you're applying a backward force. But eventually, you can have a force strong enough that will stall it and maybe even reverse it. Obviously, you'd need another truck to do that. So this is the same with these motors. Um, 
We want them to walk forward even if pulled backward. And this is the clearest indication that the walker is a motor. It's actually producing motive force. So this has the ability to perform mechanical work with some energy input. And I'll talk about the energy input. So this is our first motor. Let me see if I can. Uh, um, I've called it our original nanomotor concept. Um, and we've called that the tumbleweed, because it acts like a tumbleweed. I used to have a picture of a tumbleweed. I'm sorry I don't. Um, so let me tell you what we do is we take protein parts to, like Lego, we take little protein parts and put it together. The only difference with Lego, of course, is that the, uh, the pieces stay the same in Lego, whereas when you, when you do your molecular biology, which is so nicely, I, I did, did a lot of this work in Australia, which is so nicely called in Australia molly bolly. So when you do your molly bolly, um, you didn't even get a laugh. Wow. <laughs> Sorry, mate. <laughs> so. Um, Nice place, Australia, by the way. Um, so when you, when you actually do the molecular biology, you can actually change some conformations and so on. Well, let me tell you what the motor is. So I start off with three ligand-gated dimeric repressor proteins. And I'll tell you what a repressor is in a moment. It's not psychological. Repressor proteins labeled RA, RB, RC. And they're connected by coiled coils arranged in a flexible Y-shaped hub. So I have this hub here. Um, here I'm talking about five, roughly 5 to 10 nanometers, maybe. And if you look at this hub, basically, even though the movie I'm going to show is not flexible, these three things are flexible here. So it can, um, apart from certain steric restrictions, this, this, the, 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 they're just tiny, sort of uh, um, tiny oligomers. And um, that's one of the problems in construction. Then you, so you, you have this hub with three stiff coiled coils, so these are totally stiff. And then you again have flexible linkage to uh, the dimer, which is the repressor protein. And the important thing here is that you have three different repressor proteins. And I've labeled them RA, RB, RC. And I will apologize in advance for the next slide because this notation may change. So, and I was very careless about that. So, what's the next thing? Now, um, the R, R, RA, RB, and RC are able to bind to corresponding recognition binding sequences incorporated in a, D, in a DSDNA track. So here's your track, and here I have a, a binding sequence A, or recognition sequence A, they're palindromic, recognition sequence B, and you can see that um, here I already uh, have these bound. Now why do they bind? Well, that's the next step. The binding sites are arranged in, I first of all, um, in order to make the motor work, arrange the binding sites in a spatial asymmetric periodic sequence, ABC, 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 etc. So it's, a, it's, it's basically a one-dimensional lattice with a symmetry. And um, what happens? The repressor proteins can only bind in the presence of corresponding ligands, labeled ABC. So what happens is, if you have a repressor protein like this, where there's no ligand bound to it, ligand being a small molecule specific to the, uh, the, the protein, um, if there's no ligand bound to it, I mean, it's, uh, it just sits in this conformation. As soon as um, ligand A, I've called these ligands A, B, and C, um, ligand, I should say, ligand A binds to, um, as soon as um, ligand A binds to uh, um, the repressor A, then the repressor A changes conformation and can bind to the appropriate point in the track. The way that we want it is that, th that this, um, this repressor only binds here, this repressor only binds here, and, f and upstream there'll be C where the other repressor can bind. So that's the story. Here I've got the ligands in solution, and I'm just showing that the ligands can, even though I don't have the, li the ligands probably somewhere there, you can't really see it. So that's the mechanism. So how do we make it move? Well, the motion of the motor is controlled by a microfluidic supply of ligand pulses. So you keep pulsing in ligands, and the way that you do it, you first of all, um, uh, you do this in a, uh, um, in a time uh, periodic sequence. And let's start, suppose we have A and B in the, um, we have A and B in the aqueous medium around the, uh, um, uh, <coughs> around the, the motor. 
then you can, um, A will allow A to bind, B will allow B to bind, and it has to bind A here and B here because this is the way we've controlled the periodic sequence. What we then do, and I'll show you a movie of this because this is not my main motor, what we then do is we remove A and put in C. Um, we put in ligand C, which is related to this protein. And so what happens is that um, uh, as soon as we do that, because we have no more A, A, A is removed, this one unbinds, this one stays bound, and, this, and the whole thing starts moving. But we've so arranged the system so that, so that RC can't bind backwards, it can only bind forwards. So we have to make this pulse long enough so it can bind forwards. Once it's bound, then we again change, um, we again change the ligand atmosphere, um, keeping, um, keeping C fixed, and then B will start uh, then the whole thing will start moving and it'll go, it'll go forward and so on. So what I want to do is I want to show you a, a, a oh, I also wanted, I was told that I had to tell you this. So um, repressors are proteins which inhibit transcription when bound to DNA. I really have to tell you that otherwise. Yes? Are there any motors in nature that... No, not, no. Um, um, well, there are DNA. Um, I, I don't know of any. Um, there are actually a lot of uh, a lot of DNA motors, which were you know the, uh, the, there's a big construction by Turberfield and other people of, of of DNA motors walking on DNA. But as far as I know, um, there's not even a concept of a protein motor working on on DNA. And I'd like to know some information. Maybe somebody can tell me. Oh, well, of course there are motors in, in, in DNA itself, you know, opening up DNA and like helicases and so on. Polymerases, yeah, polymerases, yeah, the answer is yes. You have, polymer, you have DNA polymerase, RNA polymerase, helicase and others. Sorry about that. <laughs> Just shows you I'm a pretty lousy biologist, as my colleagues will agree. <laughs> Thank you for the questions. So, um, what I do is I use, uh, I make a very simple model which I sh shall show you in a minute. I use what's called Langevin dynamics. I, um, you can see here, oops, sorry. Um, this bit is, is F equals MA. We don't need that. So all we have is what I showed you to start with. That's the velocity. Here's whatever internal forces and external forces we have, conservative forces, together with a drag coefficient. And then we also add to this force. So this is a force balance equation. Velocity force balance equation. It's a force balance equation, actually. We have the drag coefficient here. And here we have, um, for the thermal fluctuations, we have a random, uh, a random force. And you can see that when you discretize this, you get something that looks like that. And the random force comes, um, the temperature comes in from the, the correlations between um, um, the, for, in the random force. So basically what we do is we use this and the, we just use this to do the, the simulation. I should mention that this is very simple hydrodynamics. We have no, um, we actually have no interactions, hydrodynamic interactions between our, um, uh, our various uh, parts of the, uh, um, sort of parts of the, of the, of, uh, um, of the motor. Um, so this is the simplest approximation, but seeing the motor small, it probably works quite well. If it were a huge polymer, it probably wouldn't. So what I've got here is um, it's not quite the motor I presented because I started off having something that I called the Y motor that was totally stiff, i.e. all the angles are fixed. Um, since then, we've, I've, I, I've done better than that, but the movie shows this. So this roughly shows you what roughly shows you what goes on in an ideal case. So the motor first has to bind. So in the first pulse, it's binding, say, A and B. So it looks around, does a diffusional search. It's sort of in the medium, and it binds to the track. So you can see A and B bound there. Then it's fiddling around until the end of the pulse. And then the end of the pulse happens. It goes all over the place. Um, well, actually, it hasn't. The end of the pulse hasn't happened. Come on, end pulse, please. Gosh, I hope this motor, this is working. Let's, let's try again. It did switch. Oh, good. Let me let me just go back. Um, okay. Yes, it switches quickly. Actually, let's do it again. 
this bit is better, that'll show you the random motion. Then you have to, I'll have to look for the switch, I always have to. My brother-in-law did this very sophisticatedly. Switches very quickly, actually. Yeah, now it's, now it's switching. There. Yeah. So, it basically keeps going along the track, like a tumbleweed. Good. Well, the directional driving force is the, both the, the, the asymmetry of the fuel and the asymmetry of the track. So, the f it's basically, the fuel here is the chemical potential of the, of the ligands, because they're being changed all the time. Also, I should mention, honestly, that in this very simple, um, in this very simple uh, uh, simulation, I assume that I have, in my pulses of ligands, I assume that the, the, as soon as the ligands are in the atmosphere, they bind, and so you get, and so the, uh, they bind to the repressor, so the repressors can bind to the track. And then as soon as I stop, they unbind. So this is a very brutal approximation, which gives you an idea of how things work. We have improved on it using a master equation. Pardon? Oh, the, 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 the energy here is, um, uh, I think I have that on another slide. I have to, uh, it's, it's, quite, it's quite small, and it's roughly of the order of, the, of, of something like ATP. I hope I have that on another slide. Okay, so the idea of the tumbleweed motion here is it exhibits processive motion by directed diffusion, track binding, uh, um, and unbinding to and from an asymmetric 1D track. Um, and it's the asymmetry that's important here as do cytoskeletal motor proteins. Um, we have non-autonomous motion, i.e. Uh, uh, um, that we provide an energy source from outside, which is chemical potentials due to changing the concentration of the ligands through external ligand pulses in a, tempor in a time periodic manner. Now, um, the point is what we've shown, but I haven't shown that, is TW can move against a rearward force, so it is a motor, but it detaches from the track at large enough rearward forces. So there's no stall or reversal of motion which you would find with cytoskeletal motors. So, let's go on. Question, can we build a motor which mimics more aspects of, uh, of protein motors, particularly kinesin? And that's where the aspect that I showed you of the zippering and the restricted binding comes in. So my next, for my next protein, my next motor, I'll talk about what I call, well, you'll see the name when we get there. We've called this SCAM. It's not a SCAM, but it's a synthetic kinesin analog motor. Um, basically, it uses the same technology as the tumbleweed motor, which is why I introduced the tumbleweed motor, which involves repressor proteins, um, coiled coils, and, and peptide. So it's, it's roughly the same idea. Here I have a, sch a schematic of it. So the actual motor has um, a, a <clears throat> um, it has a repressor. These are the repressors now. I'm very sorry about that. So I better go to the next one. SCAM only uses two types of repressor, whereas TW uses three. And the repressors I change, I call A1, which is the same as A2, and B1, which is the same as B2. So I have one repressor at this end of the coiled coil, um, and I d an identical repressor at the other end of the coiled coil, and the, and the distance between them is, the, the actual displacement between them is, I call D. That's five to, again, five to 10 nanometers. The importance here is that I have another two repressors, which I call B2 and B2 and B1, and I, I have the same distance between them, but when I join A2 and B2, I have to make sure that to get the zipper effect I want, that these two are, um, uh, that these two are uh, uh, joined by a coiled coil, I call the distance E, which is less than D. I usually use E as a half of D. But the track that I have, um, which I've labeled, uh, I better go on after this, uh, that you have the DNA binding sites, that's the track. So I've labeled those A1 and A2, they're a distance D, B1 and B2, because they have to correspond to binding of the, of the machine up here, which I hope is a machine. So I have A1, A2, B1, B2, A1, A2, B1, B2. And the asymmetry is going to come simply through the, the fuel, actually, through, the, uh, through, through the, uh, um, the ligands. And what I have for the ligands is, you'll see in the next slide, pink dots of the, of the, uh, of the ligands for the A repressors and blue dots for the B repressors. And recap, a repressor is a ligand-gated DNA-binding protein.
which we talked about before. Okay, so this is how the scam motor works. And there's an important point here. And the point is that I actually place the motor so that A1, um, sorry, it's here, so that A1 is, um, that, that A1 is, is, is on little A1, and repressor A1 is on binding site A1, repressor A2 is on binding site A2. I just have ligand A in the atmosphere. I don't have to have two ligands anymore, and these two are free to do what they want. So they can just move all over the place. I then, um, once I've done this placement, so it's a bit like the movie you saw, um, then, well, this placing, then what I do is I, um, Change the, I change the ligand pulse, and I don't take anything out, but I just introduce um, ligand uh, B so that the two, um, so that you can have a binding of the B. Now, the important thing is that um, what you find here is that because this is short, um, and that this, is, this distance is less than this distance, the only place that this can bind is here, just like kinesin. But I'll show you where the kinesin business comes in. So. Once I've got it bound like this in this stable state the, um, for a long enough pulse for the, for the A's and the B's, so the, 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 if you like the A continues, the B's introduced, then I remove the A and I just have the B here. As soon as I have the B, these two come off. So as soon as they come off, this one's unbound, um, you, you get a very vulnerable, and I'll show you why it's vulnerable configuration like this, but what's interesting is that uh, um, as soon as you put that in, the only, um, it can go all over the place, but the only place this can bind, because you have A's here, that can only bind to here. That's the only place it can bind. So what happens is, and that's the idea of the zipper, because that binds here, and by, in that way I shorten the motor. So, um, so this is the analogy to binding of neck linker onto kinesin motor head just before binding um, onto the microtubule. So again, I'll repeat, just because I've, I, I, I've released these two, I've got um, B, li a B ligand in the atmosphere, and the only thing that can happen is this does a diffusional search and eventually binds here. Once, I, once that happens, then you go back to this situation, and um, as soon as you, you get this moving around a lot, until you introduce um, uh, you, you've only got um, B, uh, the B uh, ligands here. Until you introduce the A ligands, then you get um, the only thing that can bind, is, the only way of binding is that um, this can bind here. This one can't because that's too short. So you have restricted binding. So what you have here is that the previous restri um, uh, step restricts diffusional search so that A1 can only bind to the, uh, the little site A1 and then the cycle continues. So it keeps going forward because of the way you've pulsed the ligands, that's the actual, uh, the asymmetry. Um, as I say, pink dots are for A repressors, blue dots are for B repressors. These are the lig ligand dots. And in the end, you've actually moved four lattice spacings for the whole cycle. Okay, let me just show you how this works. This is movie thanks to uh, um, the work of, of, of Dave Lee kindly volunteered his services. And it's a bit different here because I've introduced two other repressors to give you more of a zipper effect and to slow things down so that you can actually see what goes on. And there's a surprise coming. Oh, sorry, no one see anything that way. Giving it all away. Okay, so we start that way and you can see you have part of the zipper effect and then you have the rest of the zipper effect then you change the pulse and it binds forward. Next you change the pulse again so that the, 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 the two blues unbind and it zippers forward again and goes forward. That's the forward motion. Now suppose you cut the track so it can't bind any more after this. It can't bind forward after this. What's it gonna do? Anybody guess? So suppose I just cut the track. So I'm here, it's really looking for the forward point in the track but it can't find it. So it binds, but it can bind back. That takes much longer than, uh, than, than if it could bind forward. So it binds back, and then it, uh, it, it goes backwards. So in fact, this is a reversible motor. But I have to do it by cutting the track. But uh, you still have the appropriate Yes. Oh, I still have the appropriate ligands. 
Oh yes, the, the, this is only ligand pulses. I mean, what, what I had first of all, I still have the same ligand pulses I had before, slightly modified. So I have the same ligand pulses. When it gets to the end, it's got, uh, it, it, it's got the ligand pulse with just the Bs, say. It can't find the forward B. I then introduce the A and B, and it, it binds. One of the things it can do is bind back, and then it goes back. Now, can we use this? This was, uh, I know I went into Nancy's office and I said, I think we can, we can get a shuttle. And she said, great idea, just cut the track. So it's amazing what, uh, uh, what happens when you um, collaborate. So this is a shuttle. This is actually with the right number of, this is the way it moves forward, basically. Now, when it comes to the end, you will see that it, it goes, it sort of, first of all, it's, it sits on its bottom first because it can't find the binding site, and eventually it finds the backward binding site and goes backward. I'll explain this a little later. So now we've got a shuttle, so I can, uh, I treat both ends of the, uh, um, both ends of the um, track the same way, so I can get it to go forward and backward. Well, that might interest, um, yeah, sorry. But that's exactly what happens in, uh, uh, in a neuron. Here I have a neuron, right up there, and you can see that I have a vesicle, and the vesicle has two motors. And what happens is, suppose this is full of neurotransmitters. That means the vesicle will go that way and, and deliver, and then it can come um, using one motor, using kinesin, which goes from the, the minus end to the plus end. And then, once it's delivered, it can go back in some way and use dynein to return. So we could imagine this, and, but here I do exactly that, but with one motor, not two motors. And so one of the things that you could imagine is that um, when it gets to, we'll wait till it gets to the end, it has no load at present. When it gets to the end, it picks up a load which mustn't be too large, and then it takes the load to the other end, delivers it, and goes back. So in fact, this could be a, a very useful motor, I hope. So the next thing I want to talk about is uh, a little bit about what happens when you try to pull the motor back. Just make sure that I'm not overdoing the time. I've still got a little bit of time. Oops, sorry. So, so what we have here is I'm talking about reversal and stall transition for SCAM in the case of non-ideal motion. I showed you ideal motion, but suppose, for example, um, I ha I, instead of just cutting the track, I actually put um, a, a, a force uh, I actually put a conservative force, a rearward force, which is pulling the motor backwards. This is a very important thing, because we want the motor to go forwards when I'm trying to pull it backwards, at least for some forces. How does that, what happens to this motor? Well, what can happen is if I, um, suppose I have the force, you'll have to imagine it, and I'm pulling it backwards, and at present this is bound this way, that's fine, and then I switch the ligand, so here I have ligand A, ligand B, everything binds beautifully, and then I take away ligand A. And so that unbinds. What can happen? Well, one thing can happen, of course, if we're lucky enough and the force isn't too big, it can go forward, i.e. you get the zippering motion forward here. And that's that. But if it's... Uh, um, <coughs> As you have different uh, first passage times, for example, uh, under forces, it could be a, a pro there's a probability that it will reverse. As I, I showed you the reverse for, for the cutting of the, uh, um, of the track. So what you can get is you can get this binding to here. And then it continues and it reverses like I showed you. This is basically a motion which, when I, 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 I change the pulse, um, <clears throat> when I change the pulse, unbind and rebind, it goes forwards. The pulses, I should say. Another thing it can do is we could also get A1 binding to A1, in which case it sits back, basically. I call that a temporary store. Or else you could have um, uh, um, A2 binding to A2. This one I've called temporary stall 1. This one I've called temporary stall 2. So let me repeat. I've got a possibility of forward, going forward, I have a possibility of reversing, and I have a possibility of, of, of it sitting, of the motor sitting back to, to what it was to start with, which I call stall one. I have a second one called stall two. So how do I handle all that? Well, let me just, uh, um, I've already shown this movie, so I don't think I'll show it again. This movie was actually, I cheated 
because the movie was under a force, but it did the same thing as kind of, it does the same thing as if you were coming to the end of a track. So I don't think you want to see the movie again. So I'll, I'll, I'll proceed onwards. So if you remember the various things that happen, here I have the probability of transition as a function of rearward force. So along here I have rearward force, forces which I have in piconewtons. And I want to say that five piconewtons, I forgot to say, five piconewtons was the uh, force that stopped kinesin. So we are of that same order of magnitude here. Is there anything like a stall force? Not quite. So what I have is that if I put on a very small force, I should mention what the probabilities are. This is the probability of forward motion. I have a probability of forward motion with a small force, and nothing else happens at all. It can just go forward because the forward motion is very fast. But I'm slowly inhibiting the forward motion. So at something that I call a reversing force here, that's where the motor can start, it, it, it goes forward, but then at some point it starts having a probability, this blue probability of reversing. Interestingly enough, also as this, the probability of going forward goes, of having a forward step goes down, the probability of having stalling, particularly the, um, <coughs> what is it, uh, stall number one, really rises. So it can easily sit back and also, stall number two isn't so big, but that also rises. The point is that there's all, always, you start having a finite probability of it reversing. As soon as you get that, rever that one reversing um, uh, uh, step, it'll continue. It'll, it, 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 it'll start going, going backwards nicely and processively. So what you find is, you find, just as I showed with the motor, that it can come to the end, it can stall, but then eventually, when I get the probability of reversing, it'll reverse. So I, want you to, I don't want you to bother with the, uh, with the temporary stalls. I just want you to have a look at the forward probability and the reverse probability. And what we do is we arbitrarily call a stall force a force where the probability of going forward is the same as the probability of reversing. But in this region here, you get forward motion, which is followed by reverse motion, and you get some intermediate stalls. Then finally, finally, as you increase the force, um, here the st I should mention this is a, a very short ligand pulse, but I'll show you what happens as a function of ligand pulse in a moment. So concentrate on this reversing force and on the stall force, but eventually what happens is that the machine can't go forward at all when the force is strong enough. It can only go processively backwards but it, it can stall. So what you find when you look at, I haven't time to show you, you find that when you pull it, it'll start by stalling, may go one step forward or something. It'll start by stalling either here or here, and then eventually there'll be a probability of reversing, it'll go back. So you have three regions. You have pure forward motion, you have pure reverse motion, and then you have this intermediate motion. So in, in, I've called this a stall region. If you actually have a, a molecular motor like kinesin, you can put a force on it that will stall it, and then it'll go backwards. Here we don't have a clear, for, a clear stall, but it behaves more or less the same way, but in, um, in, 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 a, in um, using a different mechanism. Okay, so I then want to... Uh, just show you this. What happens is here I have the rever here I have a re this is rearward force in this direction, and this is pulse time. So up to here I have 0.6 milliseconds for the ligand pulse time. I'm assuming all the pulses that I showed you, the, the four different pulses, are all the same, the same length. And what I find is first of all the reversing force. That's the force at which you start getting reverse motion. You can see what happens. That increases. That increases initially. Very, you have an, a region here where, um, at very very small ligand pulse times, you can actually get reverses because the pulse is too short. As soon as the pulse is reasonable, you you get the picture that I just showed you, and you have a reversing force which increases. And I think eventually will will saturate, but I haven't really simulated that far yet. The stall force is of course larger, but behaves in the same way. So, this, so as you pull, uh, as you pull more strongly, as you, uh, sorry, as the ligand pulse increases, 
you can imagine that the stall force increases, but you have to get to a point where it just flattens out. It doesn't matter anymore. So, so I'm sorry? Oh, the, oh, I see. Oh, the probably doesn't add up to one because you've got the other possibilities of it stalling. Well, they should add up to one. There's, there's the, um, they did add, add up to one when I, I drew it. So that should, that should actually technically add up to one. If it doesn't add up to one, then I haven't plotted it properly. But they, the, certainly in the simulations that I had, um, everything added quite nicely up to one. Because here it certainly adds up to one. And I think if you add these, because zero is here. I think, I think it, I mean, I can show you the numbers. They do actually add up to one. You may not be satisfied with this answer, but they do add, they do add up to one. I have all the numbers, and, and in fact, they should do. I might have made some mistake in plotting. But certainly, this is the way it goes. I've plotted a lot of these, and they add up to one. OK. Let me give a summary. So SCAM is able to, for, to, to perform work against an external force. Sorry about that if they don't add up. SCAM can move forward processively or for rearward forces less than a reversing force, which depends on the ligand pulse time. Um, a quantitative measure of motor behavior is the average thermodynamic efficiency. And we have a very small, uh, we have a, 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 um, a sort of intuitive way of looking at it in terms of chemical potentials because it's really the, 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 um, the energy that's taken out um, when you bind and when you unbind. And that is, um, chemical potential gives us something that's quite large, 12% to, to 36%, but we have to look at that again. We haven't really done it properly, but this gives you a rough idea. Kinesin is 50% and maybe more. Um, the scan speed depends on ligand pulse time. It's completely controlled by ligand pulse time. But as I showed you, that uh, as I mentioned to you, that if you actually go, um, if you actually go to very very small pulse times, you can uh, um, uh, the pulse times are not long enough, and you get reversals and you get the motor coming off. And so I do have a minimum value for the numbers that I used which is about 0.35 millimeters per second for an ultra low pulse time of 30, um, mic uh, uh, micro um, 30 micrometers per second, sorry. Sorry, th uh, 30 microseconds. And um, this is extremely small. You'd never get a pulse time like that. But that's just a, a lower limit. OK, I, just to finish. And so what we have is scam mimics, kinesin, neck linker, zippering, followed by restricted binding site search and binding to a track. So it really mimics in a very controllable manner the way that kinesin works, because we, we're powering it from outside. But we don't have a power stroke. So SCAM can be used as a transporting shuttle, which is a very useful property. I just want to say, thanks to talking with um, various people, Mike Kirkness and, and, and Dipanka, that changing the ligand atmosphere is a bit awkward. You know, there is, um, that has been constructed and can be done. But if you can change the ligand-gated binding protein to a photo-switchable one, so instead of putting, uh, instead of um, making it change conformation and bind when it binds a ligand, you might be able to make it um, <coughs> um, change conformation uh, with a photo-switch when you put on a specific type of light i.e. blue light, for example. This one works the other way. In this case, um, with this particular one here, you ha it's photo switchable. And what happens is it binds in this form. Um, in the absence of light, you put on light. Um, it changes con conformation completely. Don't forget it's attached to a, a hub in our case. So these don't come apart. And um, it changes very quickly, I believe. And then when you take off the light, it can, uh, you can have a <coughs> Uh, um, you, you'll have a sort of thermal diffusion where, where things come, where things start coming to, uh, or you'll have a thermal, so uh, <coughs> thermal behavior, it'll be um, temperature will, uh, temperature fluctuations will work to make it come back to this. So you, the, and that might be rather slow, but at least you can take your whole apparatus, you can bathe it in light, and then you can switch the light off. So that's, I think, an improvement. 
Um, so thanks to everybody for these suggestions. Um, I, I'm not going to show anything to do with this, but we have another motor. This is a, uh, um, this is a, a, a DNA moving in a, in, in a microchannel, which is coated with repressor proteins, and we use salt to, to contract it. Um, I'll just, I'll show it very quickly. I can't, so it's sort of, uh, but I won't explain it. You'll have to ask questions about it. So that, that one does have a power stroke, which is induced by salt and electrostatic interactions. So I have to stop that. I don't want to talk about that. Then we have Nancy Ford talks very nicely about the lawnmower. This is actually a, uh, um, this is actually a motor which behaves like a burnt bridges motor on collagen. It actually, it actually cuts up its track and, in this, uh, and hopefully moves forward. And we have our two experts here, um, Susanna Kovacic and uh, Lale Sami, who's in the audience, who are actually building this. But if you want to ask questions, they're right here. Um, so I wish to thank all the wonderful people with whom I've had the opportunity to work on this project. Special thanks to um, the motor group I showed you, the Human Frontier Science Project motor group, the Ford lab, the, the Jennifer Thiewalt lab, the Friskin lab, Chi Ming, who's in the audience and found my mistake, <laughs> and um, uh, uh, Dipanka Sen, Dave Lee for the movies and Adam Waters for the movies. And here you have a picture of my marvelous family. These are only five of the uh, one child and five of the grandchildren out of 14. Thank you very much. Martin? So, questions, please. Uh -huh. Please. Oh. So it was very clear now, Martin, I mean, having spoken with you, I mean, it wasn't as clear as what you just <laughs> described. I mean, when I spoke with you before, it, it was never as clear as how the beautiful, beautiful presentation well, I'm thankful right for that. <laughs> <laughs> but I was curious that uh, your simulations with, with the two-legged tumbleweed, or whether it's a tumbleweed or is going in some other way. The tumbleweed is three-legged um, and this one's the other okay, one's so more but, or less two-legged. But your two simulation is, is a two-legged entity, yes. whichever way it moves. Yes. So wh wh what is the, the appeal of working experimentally with the three-legged creature? Because the chance of something going wrong is probably to the power of n, of number of legs to the power of n. Well, so, I, I think that, um, oh, you mean what, why work with the three-legged one? Two-legged, with the two-legged two uh, experimental system. Well, the two-legged was sort of discovered way after the three-legged was started, people started working on the three-legged. So what happened was that, I mean, that, uh, what happened, the history of this is the first motor we looked at was the tumbleweed. That was actually a, a motor thought up by Paul Kermy, who's in Australia. And um, I simulated it, and also a, st a very good student um, uh, working with Heiner Linke, um, Nathan Kawada, simulated it. We did a lot of tuning, finding out what interactions were supposed to be. And the next step was that, that the motor would be constructed. Now, the, the motor, the track w was constructed here um, by Lale, I think, and the, by No, <laughs> who's gone, and the, 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 that's the track, the DNA track. The motor was, co um, was constructed in Australia, but the problem was that two legs were connected by intine chemistry, but it was found very difficult to connect the third leg. That's why it's probably best to stay with the two legs. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, um, no, the, the, the three leg, the, the two legs, are, it has the same problem. You still have, you know, you still, in the middle, you still have to join two of them and have a third. So you have a real problem there. But the point is that until that was done, until that, uh, um, I, I went to Australia again because I have grandchildren there who were unfortunately not shown. And um, when I went there, uh, I, um, we started studying kinesin quite, you know, we looked at the papers. Um, and I, I spoke one hour a day to, uh, to Paul, and we were thinking about how we could use it. And so that's when we, after we, we actually, after a couple of sleepless nights, we thought, thought, thought the motor out. So in fact, the second motor perhaps should have been looked at first, but it's way after. The, the, um, and that may answer your question as to why it's and not. Just a small comment, there. and uh, to physicists it may not be interesting, but uh, you can get two, just by using this system of repressors and repressor binding sites, you could have a motion on the DNA which is literally going on one face of the DNA, or you can have a precessive one where it goes, follows the helical track. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. So it goes around and around. So those are two kinds of motion. But one would rather have it physics, on top, but, I guess. But yeah. and what, we, what we've tried to do is we've, we, we, we want to, um, the, 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 uh, the motor is actually just a little above a sort of a, a lipid bilayer. 
So hopefully it's not going to it's not going to be able to to go underneath. I should mention there are lots you of position things. The, you can position the things uh, at will and make it go that way. Oh, you can make it go that way. That's what we'll, I'll have to talk to you because that would be a very good way of doing it. I just wanted to say that there are other things I haven't included, such as non-specific binding, which is weaker. But we do have that in the paper that can cause some problems. There is another question. Yeah, a very enlightening presentation. Thank you. Well, thank um, you very much. I have two questions. One, you showed an animation of the... A DNA strand moving on the microfluidic channel. Yes. What are the dimensions of those channels? Ah, okay. I can answer that conveniently. What <laughs> What happens is that you have um, you have um, lambda DNA in there, which is um, sixteen, uh, roughly sixteen micrometers long, um, and but the point is that the persistence length is, uh, um, i.e. the effect, well, the effective bond length is 100 nanometers. So what you do is you have a micro, this has already been done, you have a micro channel of the order of 50, 100, 200, and then you put, you spread, you put your DNA in there and it spreads out because it can't reverse. So that's, that's the main point. Then what you do with, I love talking about this one, then what you do is you, um, you, you have it in there and you actually coat the, uh, you, you coat the, um, uh, the microchannel with repressors, and then you start the pulses. But you again have the same pulses that I showed you for the scam, but you also have salt pulses. So the salt pulses, if you have high salt, it'll contract. If you have uh, low salt, it'll expand. So if you work it rightly, you'll get it moving like this. That's the way it works. Uh, my next question is, um, the, the bacteria have the flagellar motor. Yes. Uh, how does this compare with that? Badly, I think. Oh. <laughs> no, this is, this is, uh, I think what we're trying to do here is, uh, I think it would be very, very hard if we tried anything with rotary motors because you have the flagella motors and you have the F, 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 F0, F1, ATPase motor, which rotate. I think these are very, mu they're multi-components and we have nowhere near those components. I mean, that's why we, we stuck to um, the cytoskeletal motor because they have two legs and that makes life simple. We have other motors that look like, that, that, that could be used for that. But basically, um, for the, the inchworm, the scam and the tumbleweed, those three, we base things on, 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 the, on the motors because they're, they're sort of, in some sense, conceptually easy to deal so, with, so these with, basically with few components. Translate back and forth. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and um, but if you look at the other motor, which was uh, the motor that I showed you, the the lawnmower, which eats up its track, that that's completely autonomous, but it does have problems. Meant because you know you eat up your track. That's really like uh, having a truck which is breaking the road when it's moving, breaking the road hopefully behind it when it's moving, but it might break the road in front of it. So you have a bit of a problem. Thank you I have one, one more question. Oh, absolutely. Is there a lifetime for this? Or so long as you give ATP, it'll keep going forever? Or is there a lifetime? Um, oh, you mean, well, I think at some time, well, what happens is that it, 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 it uh, you, you mean the, uh, the kinesin motors? The, the, yeah, the whole structure. So for, the, for the kinesin motor, for our motors, I don't know. Um, um, but for the kinesin motors, you basically, it has to get from one end of the track to the other. So the idea is it has to be quite processive. But it, and as I said, it can it can it can go um, 100 steps each step, eight nanometers, um, before it comes off. So basically, it and that's what you mean by a processive motor. I happen to show you um, my nice little motor, the scam, which is completely processive in what I do. But when I start putting um, non-specific binding in, or I, um, um, then I find that it's no longer processive; it can come off. So it's no longer com uh, perfectly processive. And also, the other thing I haven't included, which you do include in the case of kinesin, is that I've said, you know, is, um, it can bind, it, the, the motor can bind, uh, um, it binds immediately. I'm not the motor, but the repressor binds immediately at one point, uh, as, as soon as you put the pulse in, and then it comes off when the pulse uh, stops. But that's not good enough. You do have relaxation times. And so one has to go to a, a better form in order to get the reality for this, which we've done for the tumbleweed. Um, you actually have to use something like a master equation or a continuous time random walk, which is a bit more difficult. Yes. Um, I enjoyed it a lot, Martin. Um, Very much. Um, so uh, the thing about kinesin, is that it doesn't require pulses because one ligand, the blue ligand maybe, turns into the pink ligand 
through hydrolysis. Absolutely. And so you could accomplish the same thing here if you only gave it pulses of blue ligand and gave it an expiry date so it turned into a pink ligand. Oh, yes. And I, then I agree. just had to reintroduce yeah. the blue ligand over again. So you'd have to do some chemistry yeah. to be able uh, to do but, that. But then um, you would not have fixed pulse times. No. So if you randomize your pulse times, will this still work efficiently? And is there a kind of, uh, will that affect the, 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 the efficiency with which it can turn around, for instance? I think the answer is how random do you have the pulse time? If you can, the pulse time has to be a certain minimum. And if it's if it's if it's greater than that minimum, then your um, uh, your stall will it'll stall. It will, it will and, and then, of course, that minimum has to increase if you put a load on it. And I did forget to mention that one of the simulations I want to do is to put to put a load on scam and see an, an, uh, a proper load, not just a backward force, in which I have a stalk that's going to be harder and and, and a load. Because so we, so yeah. you, you do have that problem. Because because then if you are only giving it the blue and waiting for it to convert spontaneously and randomly to pink, then the problem is that there is some time where you're not giving it any ligand at all. You're just giving it blue and then nothing, and then it can fall off. Yes, well, I think what you'll find is you'll have to work it properly so that you get a good processivity like kinesin. And then that's a very good, nice idea. It would I have to talk to you more about that. Thank you. If not, let us thank. Thank you very much. I wanted. Thank you, Martin. I just. I want to say one thing more. I really want to thank um, Vesso and Pam and all the staff of. uh, of, of, of Ermax, the staff of Ermax, because they're the ones who did the hard work for this uh, Royal Society series. I was just the guy who thought it up and mentioned it to Vesso. And then Vesso who is, and, and Pam, who are amazing people, got it all going. So I'd really like you to applaud them. Oh, thank you, Matt.